Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our creation overview series. We're going to be looking at all of the different creation tools that comes with Pop-Up Dungeon. Uh, we're just going to go over the campaign creator tool first. It's kind of the biggest one. Um, it's got a lot of things that you can start thinking about, so we want to get this one out of the way first um, so you can start conceptualizing your own adventures. So we're going to start with the flag. The flag is uh, basically just your values that you can set throughout your campaign. This can be anything you can imagine from uh, a, your own form of experience or currencies to keys, uh, quest items, crafting uh, materials, or just things that are holding inf information like uh, someone's response to a question that will then have an effect later on in your story. The crux of the game, the level, is highly customizable. The UIs are also very adjustable. Uh, this is not the finished look of them, but the functionality is here. So you can adjust your UI to best suit whatever creation you're working on now. Um, so of course, as you can expect, I'm not gonna go through all of these. We're gonna go through a more in-depth version later, but uh, I just wanted to give you a look here. Uh, for instance, what you can do with a level. You can set what kind of level you're gonna want. Um, you're going to be able to set a custom encounter where you can dictate which enemies will show up, otherwise it'll just be randomized. You can change the day-night cycles, the override the music, um, and all kinds of other things like setting the number of encounters and the encounter sizes, whether it favors bosses or swarms. Of course, you can set the level and you can set a description. That's true of uh, pretty much any node that will show up on the table. <clears throat> So the next one that we're going to look at is a challenge. A challenge has many different ways uh, from just straight rolls versus statistic checks and uh, action type affinities. That means how many of these types of actions, like for instance, slashing actions uh, your character takes. You can also do actual uh, ability things like heals, resurrects, push and pulls, movement abilities, like if you're trying to jump over a gorge or something. And then this is going to obviously bring up the uh, dice roll. and players will be able to roll, and as long as they beat the roll, they win the challenge. You'll see the little X and the little uh, arrow here. The arrow in green means it's a good output. So if I was to create another node, this would mean that I, I won the challenge, I go here, and if I lose the challenge, I go here. You'll see that this has little Xs, and this is green little arrows as well, just to help you keep track. Then what you might want to do with a challenge is reward if they win and punish if they lose. So we've got a wealth of options here that we can look at. Um, again, we're going to go into specifics later. Um, we'll probably have a video covering each of these nodes. Uh, and of course, you can feel free to explore on your own here. Um, we'll have better tool tipping uh, for the early access. But you can reward or punish. Um, that includes anything like adding uh, new uh, allies. You can, of course, modify statistics, grant equipment, change abilities, grant abilities. Uh, you can do almost anything that the game can do through this. And the ones that are neutral are modifies. So you can change the encounters that are going to come up. You can switch out the parties. Um, you can even change difficulty settings, uh, cosmetic changes, like you know, any any future levels are going to now include this kind of ambiance. And then your most basic node for telling your story is a story node. And so this is just an image. It's the one that you've probably seen most of. It's just an image and text. And you just say yes to move on. There's no option there. Um, it, but you can use it, of course, to branch. So if you had multiple story nodes presented at the same time, this is how you could make a fork in the road, let's just say. Then we have the dialogue graph. Now the dialogue graph is similar to a story node in that it's going to present players with their, uh, you know, the, the image that you see here and the text. Same way, except when you click OK, you're going to go into the dialogue. So let's jump in here. And this looks a little bit jumbled. So we are going to use the auto layout feature to make it nice and legible. So here you can set and create um, new speakers. You can you know, choose from specific uh, characters and enemies, or you can just set it to your party leader or a specific character. In this case, we're just gonna use the party leader, whoever that might be. It'll change according to that. Um, you can set their emotion. There's uh, some emotions to choose from besides neutral. 
You can even set choice dialogue. <clears throat> this would be uh, over here, for instance, when you have a branching dialogue. If it's too long and you want it to keep it brief, you can just put an abridged version there. It's just completely optional. You also have sound that comes with it. So this is if you want to do voice acting or if you know they just heard a sound and you wanted to uh, play that sound. And you can do an image override entirely. Like let's say that uh, the warrior shows you um, his axe. Well, you can have a picture of his axe or, or his hand holding the axe and that'll come up like the little popsicle stick puppets. So then here we have a goblin. Uh, and again, these are things that you can edit. You can create your own. They have uh, text sounds, um, which you're not going to be able to hear now because I'm, I'm just recording this way. But uh, the nice thing about this is that you have a library to choose from, from typewriter sounds to pens and uh, you know more tech sounds and traditional UI sounds, modern keyboards, etc., etc., and we'll continue to grow that library out for you. On top of that, you have your audio, so he can actually say something. And this can just be a sort of a grunt or a sigh, um, that sort of thing. So now we hit a, a branch, and then you continue to talk here, and so on and so forth. And this is how a dialog graph works. You can do several things inside of a dialog graph, but we'll cover that later. Now let's take a look at a sample adventure. Now before I go into what's going on here, I just wanted to say that this took about half an hour or so to set up and will provide, you know, more or less like an hour of content, uh, maybe, maybe a little less depending on the path and how quickly you fight. So as you can see, uh, this is very, very fast turnover time for development. If you wanted to create a sort of campaign for your friends um, to play later in the evening, uh, you know, you, you are going to have about as easy of a time as, as we can make it. It may even be faster than setting up a D&D campaign. Uh, well, certainly if you wanted to get this specific. So here we start and going into a cave. Uh, we can change the audio here. Now we're going to, as we enter the cave, change the audio. This is something important to note. You can see the flag is coming through first before we are going to select this challenge. This cut through challenge is us trying to cut through some spider webs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So regardless of whether we win or we lose, we're going to actually gain Gossamer. And so this is going to be a flag. In this case, it's a flag that's actually going to show. It's going to show up in your menu. Um, you can set an icon for it here. Like for instance, with the bones here, I have a little bone icon. Here you'd be able to import your own image for Gossamer. It could be a web or it could be a cloth bolt or whatever you want to do. And of course you can make up new flags to your heart's content. So now we're going through the uh, web. If we roll a 20, and this is also something that you can set the range here for what you consider to be a crit. If you rolled the 20, you'd be able to do this super slash and you cut through the web and the spider at once and you skip the webmaster. If you didn't succeed, and this challenge is based on affinity of slashing, you have to roll a seven or better. If you didn't succeed, you can get disarmed. So this is just a negative here, and the disarm would uh, disable the party, have a 50% chance of disabling the party one time at the beginning. And this is all completely customizable. So as we move on here, we hit another dialog graph. If you can see this, it's uh, kind of transparent. That means that we have a trigger. So this trigger for the dialog graph means that it won't show up before the cheese room. Rather, it's going to show up when this trigger is met within the next level, which is this cheese room. So in this case, when combat starts, Someone will say, this can't breathe, the cavern's full of monster. So after the cheese room, we go to a spinning wheel. And if we had collected the gossamer, we're going to be able to create a silk scarf. And you might think, well, I mean, we had to have gotten the, the gossamer. It was the only path, but now I'm gonna show you this warp here. So if we had taken the other path, we can do all of this stuff over here, 
and then we end up with a warp. This warp lets you connect to places in your campaign, like so. And so you could have skipped this challenge and not gotten Gossamer. So here, this check will check if you got the Gossamer, you have the choice of creating a silk scarf. If you didn't, you have nothing to spin, but if you did, you can also keep your Gossamer. Maybe there's something to do with it later. Here's an invisible punishment. You can have rewards and punishments and not show up. This is kind of to surprise people in a level or to just add a bunch of different rewards and punishments all at once without having to have a lot of click through. The checks can also do this, which is consume if true. That means you don't have to have this minus afterwards. That's just a convenience factor. And that's if we went this way and we ended up getting a rib and you get this rib within a dialogue. So you can see you can do a lot of different things within dialogue here. Um, this pick one here is a random. So this is how you can handle a little bit of uh, proceduralness, even in your own design. Um, you can change the lighting back here as well. So you, you, you can actually affect the lighting on the table itself, not just the levels. So if you had gone that way and you talked to that skeleton down there and you got his rib, he's gonna come and try to help you when you fight the dragon. And then finally, we end up with a persistent flag. So this persistent flag will actually carry to your next campaign. This is how you can link things together from campaign to campaign. Let's say that you're cranking things out, you know, one, one episode a week, but you want some of it to carry over, the decisions that you've made, some of the progress that you've made. You can do some of that with these persisted uh, nodes. Of course, our game is designed to, you know, more or less be an hour to maybe four hours at most, six hours, sort of an experience. You can stretch it out to, you know, a longer period of time, but uh, we usually want to restart the progress since it's a roguelike, but you can still kind of override that a bit with these flags. Now we're going to go into the advanced, which I'm just briefly going to cover here. Flags can actually be driven by other flags values. Here we're setting our score to 200% of HP. Of course, that's all customizable. Here we're checking consistently. This is a, a warp that happens based on a flag value. This HP that I'm talking about here is not the HP inside of combat, but just a flag I created called HP. So that means you could have HP outside of combat uh, in case you, know, you have an adventure game in which the party may be losing HP. You can affect their actual health in combat and you can affect it outside of combat as well and even you know, lose the game if they went under one HP as, as this warp does. I just wanted to show you this is kind of the, the more advanced feature for when you're working with other people. You can actually create these sort of linked references. This, this uh, of course, is temporary, but this um, graph is red now. This means that any time that I'm affecting this subgraph here, I'm affecting all of the instances of treasure chests throughout, you know, whatever campaign. So you can also have somebody else work on this and just import this uh, from Steam Workshop or from your friend or whoever. And that way he can be taking care of the treasure chests or the pizza parlors or whatever it might be that you want to have scattered throughout your game. This is a little loop node, it's just a convenience feature, so you can run through a level three times before moving on. And then this is probably the most advanced feature. It's very useful for if you're trying to simulate AI, um, you know, decision-making AI that has a little bit of randomness thrown in. So here we, you know, just to make believe we're going to a wishing well and we're going to try to make a wish and see what happens. So this node will automatically evaluate whether these things can be executed or not based on these checks. So if you didn't have any Gossamer, this one is removed. If you didn't have a rib, this one is removed. So it would just be picking between strength or a monkey paw, which might be a bad uh, result. This can be anything. So this can be uh, AI that is being driven based on you know the current status of the entity, whether they're HP is being tracked or the range to the target or whatever it might be. So you can start getting pretty creative here. And of course, it can also be used to simulate certain board game aspects. And that's going to be it for the overview for this uh, system. As you can see, it's very, very flexible. 
Uh, the idea is if somehow we could go back in time and have all of the DMs that ever made campaigns for something like Dungeons and Dragons or a tabletop game, could you imagine the wealth of content that we'd have now? Well, this helps us preserve all of the work that you might do, even just for friends. If you want to share it, then uh, hopefully eventually we'll have a huge library of games uh, nearly inexhaustible for everyone to play. Thanks for your time.